I hope you find this panel interesting um, and yeah, we'll hopefully get to catch up at the end. But I'd like to invite the panel onto the stage now. Thank you so much. I'd love to hear, Dania, what your thoughts were on watching it. I think Kamal described it as a, a challenging watch at times um, and also to relive your experiences. It'd be great to kind of hear what your thoughts were um, on the story that we tried to tell. The experiences of abuse or harassment or whatever we experience as, as women or, and men, it's real. It has an impact on our mental health, our physical health ultimately as well. Is there an echo or is it just me? So, um, in my experiences, that has been dismissed again and again and again over the years, and it's been minimised so much. So, to watch it, it's kind of saying, OK, we're admitting how bad this is, and that in itself is healing. But it's also saying, this is bad, which mm. brings up the pain of it all, and how overwhelming all of it is. You know, how do we move forward? How do we work together? Um, yeah. Yeah. That's... yeah. Um, Farah, I think kind of people talk a lot about kind of the re-traumatizing experience of, of talking about these, these awful experiences that people have and, but then also how vital that is, as we've said, to sort of hearing those conversations and having that contribution. So I wonder how you found watching that film this evening. Um, I'm not really out of trauma. Mm. So, um, Watching that is not really any different to the rest of my days and my family, family's days. Um, so it, it's difficult because, of course, I do have moments where uh, you know I, I can be uh, normal again. But you know there are moments, mm -hmm. and actually there is a constant film in my head, and the same with my family. So, um, but it's very important, and I make myself be here um, because uh, people like us, uh, it's victims that change things, and we have to speak up. And I think actually it's, it's wonderful <laughs> that, that I, we, we are sitting here and watching this, and that you've made this, and I think that's brilliant. And hopefully we won't be on this street again. And um, this time it will change. And I know that I certainly won't stop mm. until it does. And I know that there are people here and your team and people that I've met in the Met Police and people that I've met in the homicide team and people that I've met in the media and the leaders. I, I feel hopeful. At the same time, of course, completely lost hope and completely feeling destroyed. But, you know, perhaps, you know, one can feel both at the same time. And um, so I, I do, I feel very hopeful and I'm very grateful for what you've done. No, you're very grateful to you. Louisa, I suppose for you watching that, at, at times challenging and difficult, kind of unflinching truths about some of the things that happened in the Met, but as far as there's also some hope, I, I found Sarah out on the Project Vigilance um, ride out. I, I think she was an incredible ambassador for your organisation, someone who has experienced her own, has had her own experience and is and wants to challenge and change that. Um, I wonder how you found watching it. So I thought it was really powerful and powerful because it's based on people's personal experiences and um, powerful in terms of the scale of the challenge we have, um, not just the scale of the challenge of tackling violence against women and girls, but the scale of the challenge of rebuilding trust in the Met because it's, it's so important for us. You know, Without the trust of the communities of London, we cannot do our job and we want to do our job and we want to do it well. But, you know, hearing powerful stories, will, it will resonate for everyone in the Met. You know, policing, we're not a business, we don't make a profit, we don't make things, we, we employ people. And we're a business of, we're an organisation of people that should be serving the communities of London well, and London deserves good policing. Um, and, and powerful accounts like this means that everyone in the Met 
sees the imperative for change. And, and we'll only get this right when everybody can see that we need to change and recognise that this is about all of us changing the way that we work and rebuilding trust and, and really making a difference. So I'm so grateful for you providing you know such a powerful platform for for that message but also it gets across there that there isn't you know this isn't about all police are bad as you said Sarah's a great ambassador and there are many people like Sarah within the organization who you know many people join policing because we want to make a difference because fairness and justice and you know is, is so important to us and it's, uh, it's uh, at our heart and what we want to do but there's an awful lot to fix isn't there yeah um I'm kind of minded to Sir Trevor, you wrote about, I won't call you Sir Trevor again, sorry, this is my go. second time. Um, you wrote, at, when Mark Rowley was appointed as the Met Commissioner, um, you thought he was the right man for the job. He sort of didn't have sort of political ties to the organisation previously. He did a kind of clean sleep, sweep of management. Um, and you also welcomed the, the Casey report, I think you described it as two stiletto heel marks in, in the Met Police, um, which is a wonderful description. Um, how do you think he's doing? How would you rate him and his response to the Casey report? And he's nearly a year in to his tenure. Uh, well, can I just say first thing? Uh, I can't see where Lu Lucy is, but I, I just, I've made something, I think probably like 800 hours of films for television and a lot of them um, are about the Met because I used to present a program called the London Program and crime and the Met were sort of staple. Uh, so I've got a big long show reel and I just wanted to say to Lucy and to Kamal, I would not at all be unhappy if that film were on my show reel. I thought it was really great. So congratulations uh, on what you've done. I think the second thing, uh, and by the way, Romford's, it's not my home ground, it's my wife's, so my wife comes from Romford, so we're familiar with, this, with the situation. Um, I'll tell you what I thought, and I'll come to your qu question in just a second. I just wanted to say, I really agree, Sarah Wolf is an important, I mean, obviously important person herself, but I think she expresses the dilemma that we have as journalists when we're reporting the Met. The truth of the matter is that there is a battle that goes on in every institution. And there's a battle that goes on between the people who want it the old way and think what, you know, some of what we've seen is normal. And by the way, I had never seen those WhatsApp message messages before and they make you want to vomit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But the thing is, what you know is that there are a lot of people who work with Louise, Louisa and will look her in the face and say that they're, you know, they wouldn't do that and then they will go away and make, do, those, do those messages themselves. And I think part of the, the, the issue that the film brought up very well by the way that Sarah was represented is that there is an argument to be had and the rest of us have to, if I can put it bluntly, have to be in some way ready to try to help Louisa make the Met the place she wants it to be rather than the place it is now. And coming to your question about Mark Rowley, I think Rowley uh, knows the Met, but he's not of the Met. And I, the, the, one of the lines that really struck me in this was when Sarah uh, Wolf said, they're not one of us. And I think that the problem is at the moment for a lot of the people in the Met, Wayne Cousins and his behaviour is one of us. And part of what we've got to try and do, and what I think Louise Casey is a good friend and who, frankly, normally goes into these things with bobber boots on, is to get to the place where one of us means Louisa and Sarah Wolfe, not Wayne Cousins and horrors like them. Mm. And I think Rowley's trying to do that and he's doing the first thing, which is fessing up, saying it's like it is. Now, there's a lot, long way to go to make it not like that, but at least acknowledging it. And sorry, the last thing I'm going to say, I, I had, when I was doing the London programme, I interviewed the Met Commissioner every year, which meant that for maybe 15 years, I went through four or five of them. And the one thing that I would say that is different about Rowley, even different to Cressida Dick, who I knew very well, 
is that he's unafraid of saying we're not right. All of the one met commissioners I, did, I would have interviewed in the past would have found a way of defending themselves or at least saying this is a bad apple, we'll get rid of this one and it'll all be all right. Mm -hmm. And the great thing, I th the positive thing, I think, Rowley's not saying, you know, it'll all be all right, trust me. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you, what do you, I mean, what's your assessment as a new boss? I don't any of you think about them all. Um, but what, what do you think? So, yes, there is a very clear focus on accepting our challenge and facing up to it. And I think that, you know, we are, we are really clear within the organisation. <coughs> those horrific people, David Carrick, Wayne Cousins, the officers on the WhatsApp and... The first time I saw those messages was when I saw the movie that Lucy shared um, just a few days ago, and I felt physically sick. Um, I dismissed David Carrick, which was a moment of, you know, it was a, an administrative thing because he was already, you know, convicted, and it was the accelerated hearing, but it meant that I read through his charges. Um, I found that incredibly hard, and I've worked in violence against women and girls for a very long time it's something that really motivates me in policing it's something I want to come to the Met to make a difference um, but I think you know we the first part of us making a difference in the Met is accepting these people were in our organization and we did not identify them soon enough we tolerated things that we shouldn't have done and we made too many excuses we put too much value on people's skills and didn't look deep enough at their behaviour, their values, their conduct. And we've got to change that. So um, my boss is very clear about his expectations in that. He's very clear about what needs to change. And he's very clear about the steps to get us to a better place in terms of this starts with building trust. And, and part of trust is accepting when we've got it wrong. Mm -hmm. Part of trust is, is, is investing time in building relationships with our critics. Mm -hmm and welcoming people who are rightly angry in, about what we've done, but constructively angry and helping us to be better. And what I love about the film is, is it, it, what comes across is, is Lucy's passion for the Met to be better, because we deserve a better police service in London. Mm. I mean, do you think that a, a sort of part of accepting that, you, that there have been mistakes is, is about using the word institutional? So that's a word that comes up in the Casey report, we've had it in the McPherson report. It, it's used a lot in regards to to the Met, that there are these kind of institutional systemic problems around misogyny, racism, homophobia. Um, it's a word that Casey, that um, Mark Rowley didn't use. He said he was embarrassed, but didn't think that that was the right word to use to describe mm -hmm. the, the, the institution of the Met. Sadiq Khan also hasn't used it. The Home Secretary hasn't used it. I wonder, do you, it, does that reconcile with the desire to acknowledge that it's not just a few bad apples? So... If he were here, what he would say, and I would say this too, is fully accept the diagnosis that Louise Casey gave the organisation. There is no getting away from her diagnosis of our organisation and what she found. The word institutional itself, the, the challenge is that, you know, on the day the report was published, three different journalists gave him three different definitions of that. And, and also the word, it, it's very difficult to describe. You know, when you look at the McPherson definition it could apply so broadly to so many things, it's almost impossible to not be it. But what we do want to do is the McPherson definition of what good looks like in terms of an organisation that is anti-prejudice, that eliminates discrimination of any kind. And what we want to be is actively anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-homophobic, and get to you know the good place that McPherson describes in his report. So we are not denying the diagnosis from Baroness Casey. We, th there's a challenge with the, you know, accepting a term and a label that many people see as, if you accept that term, that means you're all racist, that means you're all... And what does that do for the Sarahs in the organisation who want us, you know, who, who aren't and want us to be good and, and are working so hard? Because we want to get to a good place with, with this. We've got to get better. Mm. Daniel, I suppose for you, would the would that sort of gesture, if we can call it that, of the of the Met Police acknowledging that it's institutional, does that <laughs> would that mean something to you in your campaign and on your journey, or is it more of a sort of semantic media obsession? Yeah, sorry, but 
boils when I have this conversation and I'm a confrontational person, this is why I'm here. <laughs> if we say it is pretty much just semantics, then why is there a focus of, okay, I, we admit we're bad, but we're not that bad. I think it does the opposite to acknowledge, actually, there is deep-rooted racism and sexism and issues within <coughs> the police force. It's broken from the bottom up. That is, it, th th with that admission, actually, I think there would be more of an ability to build trust rather than saying, okay, we're, we're bad, but not, we're not that bad. We won't use that term. I, 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 yeah, I don't understand why there was a reason to, to deny that, that word or just say, okay, we're not, we're not that. I, I don't think we're denying that we're that bad. I don't think we are at all. We're fully accepting Bar Baroness Casey's diagnosis of the organisation. Um, it, the, the term has so many meanings for different people and the, the Daily, head, Daily Mail headline would immediately be every officer in the Met is racist, every officer is sexist. And we, have a, we have a problem, as you saw in the film, of we need, to, we need to improve, we need to take our workforce with us in that. We're not saying we're not that bad, we absolutely are everything Baroness Casey describes in her in, my in opinion, her report. That's, that's where it should st stop at, and I, I don't think by admitting that an organisation is, is institutionally racist and sexist is saying every single police officer is racist and sexist because no one would make that assumption. And people know not every single police officer, but there is enough. You know, one of one thing that I keep hearing from police officers. You know, there's a lot of people that go in it with good intentions and you know, there's a lot of good police officers. But that same reason that keeps coming up is, is the, the exact thing that dismisses a lot of victims. It's the same argument that says it's just the odd apple. And actually, there's a lot of bad apples. It's, it's not just the one or two. I think we agree on that. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't help to, you, to say it's only one or two because the problem with Carrick and Cousins is we tolerated those people and we didn't root them out and we didn't respond quickly enough when, th when people had concerns. I think we'd agree on that. Mm. To, to bring you guys in, Farah. Well, I, I wanted to say that the, the Met are reflective of society, right? We have toxic masculinity in our society, and it's tolerated. And when Zara was murdered, it was tolerated that night. This man patrolled the streets for a couple of hours, and it was tolerated. And, of course, there was an absence of police as well, but it was tolerated and people didn't contact the police. And when there's 36% of people saying that they mistrust the police, that's a significant, mm. small number, isn't it? And, and that does mean that people are at risk. And, of course, if you tolerate something, if you tolerate a culture within your institution, then what does that, what does that mean? What does that say? It, it, the culture is, the, the culture needs addressing. Mm -hmm. And also perhaps we need to stop using things, words like good and bad. I, I, I don't know what that means. I don't want a good officer. I want an officer that knows how to do their job. Mm. I don't want, uh, I don't want to think, do I like this person? Can I trust this person? Is this person anti-racist? I want to know that they have gone through procedures, processes, training, and they know how to do their job, mm. and they are systemically the same with everybody. And that's how it should be operating. So I, 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 the good, the bad, it, it's, it just seems like the wrong conversation to me. Mm. Um, so, and, and I think if you do say, if you do say, use that strong language, our institution is completely rotten. It's rotten to the core because there are, you know, we have been tolerating as a society toxic ma masculinity for so long. Mm. Then if we say that, then we can start again, can't we? And that's where we need to, that's where we need to be. Mm. We need to be starting again with the likes of, you know, Sarah Wolf. Mm. And others, so do, you, do you think, Trevor, that by using the word institutional, it, it does kind of make the tech, give the Met a sort of tabula rasa to rebuild trust and relationships, as, as Farah suggests? Not really. By the way, I, I disagree with what everything Farah just said so eloquently. But in a way, my problem with the whole issue of institutional racism and sexism, the use of the phrase, 
actually, I think, was really well, well illustrated by the dialogue between you two. You two completely agree about everything, except the use of the word. And my view about that is, you know, you call it blue, you call it red. I don't really care. Do something. Yes. Mm. That's a key thing here. And, uh, and the, the other problem I've, I've always had with the phrase, uh, you know, we can get into semantics of it. Uh, I'm really old, so I actually interviewed the person who first used that phrase, who was a man called Stokely Carmichael, uh, African-American activist. Uh, he changed his name to Kwame Ture. And what Stokely Carmichael meant by institutional racism, we had applied to the New York Police Department what he meant was not about the people. His point was, it's not about the people's attitude. It's about the system and the organisation itself. Because what he said, I remember him saying to me, is you could fill the New York Police Department full of black angels and they would still be beating up black people because the way the system works and what it rewards is wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's what you've got to address. And that, that's why I... I I always rather shy away from this debate because I think it then becomes one about who can be most kind of strident in the language rather than thinking about yeah. what do you actually do? Because mm. I, I, I th for my money, the big problem that Louisa and Mark Rowley and so on have is that they work in an organisation where at the moment... Even good people, I mean, I, I do have an idea about what I think is a good person, even good people will join and they behave badly because that's what gets esteem from their colleagues. They have to be one of the boys. I mean, I bet half the people on some of those WhatsApp groups would be absolutely mortified if their mother or their sister or their wives or their daughters saw those messages, they'd be destroyed. Mm -hmm. But they feel they've got to do this. And that, to me, is a big thing that's got to be broken. What is a good police officer? What does he or she look like? And that Sarah Wolfe is one pole, but my suspicion is that she's still too much of a minority inside the, inside the Met. And that's the battle that's got to be fought. And, and, you know, and having arguments about you know, who can use the best language doesn't seem to me to help that very much. Mm -hmm. I suppose, I mean, one of the main thrusts of the film was around a breakdown of, the, a breakdown of trust and mm. we all understand that the, the concept of policing only works if you consent to be policed. Um, you, Daniel, say that your trust in the police is broken. So I suppose to think in a sort of solution-focused way, what could the Met, what should the Met be doing to win back trust of, of people like you? I just want to say it's not just broken. I, I see police officers, don't, don't, not you directly, <laughs> but just when I'm out about in police cars and I, I actually feel anxiety and yeah. a, a bit of fear. Um, for me, I don't think police officers are the right people to deal with victims of violence. I don't think they're specialised enough. It's a very... It's very complicated. It requires a lot of compassion, a lot of patience, a lot of directing um, victims through that process. The current process is absolutely brutal for victims. Mm -hmm. um, they're just, as shown in the documentary, shown as another case. And the damage that does to victims, it... it it, it, it makes it, you know, you, if you experience abuse, it can be, depending on the reaction of it and the aftermath, you can do a lot of healing. Mm. But if you have people that treat you as just a case or a number and they rush you to put your statement out and they're asking for evidence, and it, it, it makes the trauma a lot, lot worse. So in my opinion, actually, there needs to be less resources in the police and more into mental health and victims, you know, specialists mm. that can deal with victims of violence. Farah, and, and you say that you, you are tired of people telling you that they did their best because you, you don't believe them. And what would they need to show you to believe that the people were doing their best? Well, I, th I think people 
haven't done their best because I, I, I agree with Trevor because systems have broken down and it's about it is about the systems not working so good people turn bad and I, you know we experience that clearly in the probation service prison service and for us there are un, there are unanswered questions in in regards to the Met Police involvement yet so I can't comment on that but to I was just thinking, you know, the word restorative and how do you restore, restore trust? And I, in my mind, I was just thinking of a similar conversation like we're having right now in communities. And I think that that would be a, a starting point, you know, for, for police officers, for leaders in the police to be having conversations in neighbourhood groups right at the grassroots because that's where people have lost their trust and that's where people need to hear you know um, the likes of what what is it that what is it that you want from us and then and, and the conversation and I think dialogue is is powerful isn't it and then we can also look at I think I don't think it's complicated as to how to fix the things that have gone wrong and what training needs to to be in place, and, and the Casey report details exactly what we need. And I, if, if those things happen, then and, and, and there are quality assurance systems in place to make sure that we keep on looking at them. Why do things keep falling down? And it's the police, probation, and prison are extremely burdened services as well, and they're burdened because there are other services that are not being focused on. So I think that's, you know, we, we're not talking about that here. You can't isolate one service and say, well, how are we going to fix this without fixing everything, actually? We need to look at early intervention. We need to look at schools. We need to look at police going into schools. We need to look at youth offending services. We need to look at the whole gamut. And then there's less of a burnout at the end, at the end point. So I'm not saying that those people shouldn't be held accountable, and they absolutely should. And, you know, personally, I want some public apologies. My family does. We want some statements about how Zara would be alive if certain things had happened correctly. We want that. But at the same time, I totally understand that there's a whole system that's not working. Mm. I, well, two things. One is I really 100% agreed with what Dania said about... You know, cops are not trained or qualified to do certain things. And I think, for my money, a bit like teachers, we ask them to do all sorts of things that belong to somebody else and other people are better equipped to deal with them. And that's one thing that could be sorted out. But I, I sort of understand what Faris just said. And I, in my, you know, in my kind of head side of me, I, I, I agree got to deal with everything. But I have to confess, one of the things I do like... I can't bring the, the sense of fear to this discussion. I, you know, I've never felt the fear that a woman would feel. I can't. I, I, you know, I'm six foot, I'm black. Who's going to mess with me? Um, but I tell you what I do feel. What I like about what Rowley's doing is that he's getting ready to fire people. Fire their asses. That's what I say. Because if you want the people who are kind of in the middle and who are kind of doing quiet life and going along with the, the, the stuff in order so that nobody says, he's a bit soft, isn't he? What, you know, what's he doing on the job sort of thing? If you want those people to come onto the right side, they need to know that they will get sacked. And I love the fact that Rowley has shifted the balance from understanding and you've really got to, you know, prove that, that you're kind of the spawn of Satan to get kicked out to the point, to a different point. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's going to get sustained and I don't know if you're going to get political buy-in from City Hall because who knows what the politicians will do. But if I were still in City Hall, I would be saying fire hundreds of them because that's the way the things are going to happen. Louise, we'll come to you and then we'll go to some questions from the floor. <laughs> so, um, yes, you're absolutely right. And, um, and hopefully if you watch the news, you'll see that we are firing people and, and swiftly. 
Um, I was really struck by both of your points, actually, because I agree with you. There is too much that we step into and lean into the space of others, but also what I have seen, where we do have a core role in the justice process, we do that so much better when we work in partnership with really brilliant independent domestic violence advocates, independent sexual violence advocates, like on the film there, those people are brilliant at holding us to account, but also our officers learn from them about how to work with victims more effectively. So I think there's, you said that really, really powerfully. Also, Farah, you, the things you said really struck me in terms of there must be accountability when we get it wrong. And you're absolutely right, and please keep demanding that accountability. Um, but also, I love the way you describe those conversations with communities more openness about what we do but but officers you know we need to be really connected with our communities and at a very local level building a strong relationship a trusting relationship so um, but also with the many brilliant charities that work you know the buy and for services the people who support victims who can call it out when we get it wrong but pick up the phone when there might be something we can do better because the more open we are about what we're seeking to do the more we you know give communities an ability to influence the way we deliver policing the better we'll become but the the more trust we'll build the, the more we hear about what we need to focus on and the safer people will be in London. Yeah. We could also have just a female run Met, couldn't we? <laughs> just a female entirely. We could just sack all the men. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that could be a, a really effective way forward. <laughs> <laughs> one to muse on, maybe that one. Um, okay, we... very dangerous <laughs> unemployed people on the streets there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we'd love to come to you guys in the audience. If anyone has any questions, do just put up your hand. We're going to do our best. I'm going to do my best for you in a brief question time. Should we go to Sophie on this side, Jemima? In the, I couldn't have chosen anyone further away. There we go. <laughs> if you want to just introduce yourself and... Hi. Um, <laughs> hello. Yeah, hi. I'm Sophie Wilkinson. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, I've done a few bits on kind of abusive power stories and... Uh, uh, stuff about the Met and other police forces and their level of training um, uh, using freedom of information stuff like that. Thank you very much. Um, that was a brilliant, um, brilliant documentary and thank you to everyone on the panel. It's really, really interesting to hear from all of you. Um, question to everyone and no one in particular. Um, I know that the Met is trying to recruit at the moment and that is proving really difficult uh, specifically with the exact um, groups that they need to recruit in order to improve that trust. For that and many other reasons, could there be merit in just completely disbanding the Met and creating something different um, that isn't more powerful than perhaps the the government uh, at this stage? Because it does seem like it's way too big um, and unwieldy to be uh, properly threshed through um, and the swamp drained with it all. Uh, could it be easier to recruit? On that basis, could it be easier to police in communities um, for that reason? Um, yeah, could there be merit in disbanding and rebuilding from the bottom up? So first, Louise, we'll go to you on that one. So, so having worked in other police forces, I, I don't think size and scale is the problem. Um, I think focusing on how we deliver policing locally so being really locally connected. So if you live in Romford or if you live in Ealing or if you live you know, wherever you live in Hackney or Islington or Camden, you know your local police and you have a strong relationship with your police. What, what we're trying to do in the Met at the moment is we know, and Baroness Casey is really clear, there's too much sort of, um, I suppose, power within the organisation in our specialist teams. She described them as the Gucci teams with the best yeah. kit, the best equipment, the best influence, the teams who are looked after. And, and the closer you get to communities, the, the less support those officers and staff working closest. And we, we need to flip that, and we're working incredibly hard at the moment. Because for me, good looks like, as Farrah was saying earlier, getting the basics right, you know, good skills of investigation. You know, everyone in London knowing if you call the Met about your car being broken into or your house being burgled or your phone's being snatched, that you'll get a decent response from us. And those are the kind of bedrocks of, you know, people feeling the Met's doing a good job for them, whoever they are. 
Actually, our recruitment at the moment, so we are not achieving our recruitment targets. There's a lot going on in employment markets in London. Police pay is, in real terms, reduced by about 17%. Um, I know we're not the only service, but when we've, when we've canvassed people about why they might be leaving the Met or why they're applying or not applying, some of it's to do with the fact that if you come and work in policing, you know, you no longer can have your birthday at home, your Christmas at home, your, your weekends are no longer your own. You're we're going to ask an awful lot of you. And by the way, the holidays you think you've got, we're probably going to cancel them because we've got a coronation, a football match and something else to police this weekend. Um, actually, we're not seeing a, a huge amount about trust. And actually, our recruitment, the proportion of women or black and minority ethnic heritage recruits is going up. So that's a good thing. But I do think we need to do more to connect with communities so that people see not just the Met, they see my police in Romford, my police in Hackney, my police in Camden, and feel a, a local connection. Um, we're currently recruiting police community support officers. They're the bedrock of our community policing model as well. I think they're those roles that are not about coercive powers and arresting people and more about building trust and a relationship, I think will start to make a difference. But there's, there's a lot to do. But I don't think breaking it up into bits makes it any easier. Uh, well, just one quick point. I mean, one of the things that Louise, I think, said, and it's something we've debated forever and ever when I was at London Assembly, we talked about it, and that is the, the problem of the the Metropolitan Police being both a local policing force and a national policing yeah. force. And I think Louis is too polite to say, but part of the problem in the Met's culture is that, you know, I, I know they don't exist anymore, but the, the Sweeney guys with car with with who do flash cars and the ones who are in teledetectives and they got guns and all that, that's the glamour business. But the thing that we really need, and I'm not just talking about Bobby's on the beat because I think that's a bit of a fiction, but that the actual central task, which is the relationship between the f police force and the people who are policed and protected, uh, feels like a second, second division mm. thing. Mm. And I wonder myself, uh, I didn't take this view before, but I've begun to wonder whether actually we really need to strip out, though not because it's too big, but because what happens is the resources and the attention and the, the love gets sucked out of that, that local policing function and it goes on the glamour stuff, counter-terrorism and all of that. I mean, leave that to the spies. Do let the police do the job of protecting us. I, I, I've, so, I've slightly changed my view about this, actually. And, and that, interestingly, watching this has rather reaffirmed that. Because, mm -hmm. I, see, I, I want Sarah Wolf to be the person I think of rather than somebody with a gun in Westminster. That, do you see what I mean? That, that's what I want the image of the Met to be. Mm. I agree on the image. We probably disagree on the what the solution is, but I absolutely agree on the, you know, our, our priority has to be the communities of London and our relationship with those communities and the, the local policing services we deliver. There's a lot we're doing at the moment in terms of, you know, we've just run a promotion process to Sergeant. We've been really clear with all of the detectives in those central as you might have called them, Gucci teams who have been promoted are going out to take all their brilliant experience to work in local investigation teams to improve the investigations we deliver for communities in London. Mm. So we're, we're trying to do you know, lots of little things that will add up to a difference, but, but be really clear about the priority of that work locally. And it's really important, isn't it? Because we had a fantastic experience with the homicide <coughs> team. Mm. They were impeccable. But... You know, and so they, they, they got someone, but it, it, you know, it wasn't so difficult because there was CCTV and uh, enough evidence. But had that service been replicated yeah. in the police, then we would never have to meet the homicide team. I think we've got time for just one more question. Anyone would like to? Should we go down here? I wanted to ask a question about what it is that motivates people to join the police and in the context of the incredible film two women spoke about 
being motivated to join the police because they themselves had had an experience of domestic violence. As a total outsider, I would imagine that's quite a minority story about what motivates people to join the police. And I a bit have the assumption that people join the police because they've seen cop shows and there's fast cars and, and, and all of that thing. If you could set up a recruitment process that filtered out people who didn't want to do the compassionate and caring job that's motivated by yourself having had an experience as a victim, and I just wondered in terms of recruitment whether the panel had any thoughts about what, what call out the police could put to, to, to bring in people who were more like Sarah and what filtering you could do to disincentivize guys who get a hard on at the thought of having a gun and using power and abusing people. Daniel, I wonder if that's one for you because you've obviously you know, experienced, we've been through that experience of kind of being over over policed and, and you say that had there been kind of mental serv mental health provision, had there been kind of additional services, you wouldn't have, you would maybe feel differently about the police than you do now. I wonder what what would you like to see in their recruitment drive? What would you like? Who would you like? What would you like them to look for? Well, it's in a case you report. You know, the recruitment process is, is pretty poor, and it doesn't really filter out those people at all. What I, the sense of feeling I get from most police officers again, not direct to you guys, uh, is a sense of a power trip, mm. less more. I'm going to be, oh, these are people I can go to to be protected and I know that they will be caring. It's more of I have to almost prove myself to them or, you know, the, the process of when you do report um, uh, abuse or harassment or whatever. And a lot of, there's just lots of feeling of feeling like condensa cond condescending and that it, it doesn't feel, from my experience, a lot of the, the, with police officers are that kind or compassionate. And I wonder whether it could be, you know, the intention could be good, but because of the sickness <coughs> and because of the way it is, maybe they become desensitized and that's the way they operate and that's the way they speak to the public and that's, you know, how it happens. It's, it's, but yeah, in my experience, uh, it's more, okay, there's, there's a bit of a power trip. It's almost like when you on a night out with a bouncer and you're like, you can't, you can't go in. You know, there's a bit of, um, yeah, bad times. So yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> I, I think you make a really good point about people watching cop shows. I mean, there is, there is a reality and a harsh reality that we need to deal with in policing that a small minority of men are attracted to the role because of the power it affords them. And the same is true in many other professions, like the medical profession or teaching, but we have to be alive to that. And our recruitment, our first sign of defence is our recruitment. And we should be recruiting people on their values. There should be enough checks and tripwires in that process of vetting, but, but you know, vetting is a moment in time and we can't put all our eggs in that basket. We have to then have really good leadership and really good supervision. We need to reward people for good values. We need to be alive to things like empathy fatigue and the impact of, you know, if they're every day working in difficult situations, but also culture. And actually, what do we reward and recognise, but also how do we identify when culture is poor and when it becomes more about the macho side of policing and you know there are some really tricky physical roles in policing and we need people who are willing to you know in complete incredible sort of you know bare grill style training to be able to carry a gun and be a counter-terrorism firearms officer but far more people who are compassionate, empathetic, and care about the community they police, and that's what we need to recruit for and, and nurture within the organisation, but then really value it as well when we have it. Okay, I think we could carry on all evening, but I won't subject everyone to that. Um, thank you so much, our panel, to Louisa Rolf, Assistant Met Police Commissioner, Daniel Alabade, a campaigner, Zara Alina's auntie, Faranaz, and of course, Trevor Phillips. Um, <laughs> journalist, broadcaster, and the chair of many, many organizations with lots of acronyms. Um, thank you guys so much for coming out. It means so much for you to support our organization. Thank you also to everyone watching at home. I hope at least my parents are. Um, and the documentary is available to watch. So please share, like, subscribe, comment, um, and stay in touch with what we're doing because we're trying to tell really important stories every day and um, want to take you with us on our journey. So thank you so much and we'll see you soon.